morning, everyone. Good morning. Governors, premiers, and distinguished guests, welcome to Boston University. We're really honored to be hosting the 45th Conference of the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers. I'd like to recognize and welcome back to campus Boston Mayor Michelle Wu and our esteemed conference co-chairs, Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Dr. Andrew Fury and Massachusetts Governor Maura Healy. I'm very glad to be with you as I begin my tenure here at Boston University. As I visited with community members across our campus over my first two months here, I've heard time and time again how dedicated people at Boston University are to solving the world's most complex issues. And climate change is certainly one of these, and I'm committed to continuing to support the cutting edge science and the implementation of novel solutions to combat climate change. Many of these are coming out of Boston universities and at institutions across the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. It is really an honor to welcome Governor Healy as we engage around this critically important topic. As Attorney General, she held corporate actors accountable for spreading climate misinformation. On her first day as governor, she appointed Melissa Hoffer as her administration's climate chief, the first cabinet position of its kind in the nation. Her administration has committed 1% of proposed state budgets to environmental purposes, and she has launched major initiatives to decarbonize the state's housing inventory, including a green bank committed to affordable housing and investments made in a newly signed 5.1 billion housing law. And she envisions Massachusetts becoming the hub for climate tech sector. Again, Governor Healy, thank you for being here with us. It is appropriate for this conference to be held here in the Center for Computing and Data Sciences. This building is the largest fossil fuel, fossil fuel free carbon neutral building in Boston and one of the largest carbon free buildings in New England. The building was built by Suffolk Construction. The geothermal wells were drilled by a New Hampshire company. The architect was Canadian based KPMB and this is a uniquely Boston, New England and Northeast building. So let me tell you a little bit about the building. There is no gas line connected to the building. Geothermal energy provides nearly all the heating and cooling for the building. Beneath our feet are 31 geothermal boreholes that go down 1,500 feet. That is twice as deep as a Jan John Hancock building is tall, just to give you a sense. Heat pumps use the temperature differential that the earth provides to draw heat from the ground in the winter and push heat heat out during the summer. And the state-of-the-art exterior shading keeps the sun's heat out in the summer, and triple glazing keeps the heat in during the winter. 23% of the building's electricity needs are matched by solar on campus. The rest, and for that matter, the entire university's electricity consumption will be matched with renewable energy generated from BU Wind, a renewable energy project designed to displace the most carbon-intense power producers in the country. Our Center for Computing and Data Sciences showcases that we can build and operate net zero buildings in dense urban settings. And it is just one part of the university's larger climate strategy. In 2017, our Board of Trustees approved an ambitious climate action plan that set a goal of net zero direct emissions by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of the goal that the city of Boston has set for us. This was intentional because the region's large institutions must do their part to ensure the city and state meet their 2050 net zero direct emissions goals. Thank you again for holding this special event on our campus. We are so excited to see what new regional policy agreements come from the 45th Conference of the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers, and we look forward to partnering in future endeavors. I'd like to now welcome Jim Gallagher, General Counsel for Manulife Financial Corporation, to the podium to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gilliam, for the kind introduction. 
Um, and it's, it's great to be uh, back at, at Boston University. Our company, uh, Manulife John Hancock, has a long history with, uh, with BU that we're very proud of, and uh, including our uh, MLK Scholars Program, which has provided thousands of young people throughout Boston uh, with access to economic opportunity, with summer jobs, and leadership development. And we're especially proud to have John Hancock's name on the student village here at uh, BU. And in, the, and in these facilities, they particularly promote health and well-being. I'm looking forward to uh, your inauguration on September 27th and hearing about your exciting vision for BU's future. Governors, premiers, Mayor Wu, and distinguished guests, uh, while I was born in Michigan and spent early years there, I have had the privilege to actually be educated in Canada, specifically in Toronto, where I attended high school and college. Uh, I brought along with me my, my wife, who is Canadian, uh, to uh, live here in Massachusetts, where we have raised our family. And in my job with Manulife John Hancock as general counsel, I frequently travel uh, between uh, our countries. And so for me, it's, it's personal as well as a privilege to be here with all of you this morning. And Canada and the United States share the world's largest and longest international border. And I've seen firsthand how our close relationship has been forged by similar values, common interests, and close economic integration. Our long-standing free trade agreements are the foundation of over a trillion dollars in annual cross-border trade and investment, almost three billion dollars a day. And this conference is a testament to how New England and Eastern Canada continue to prioritize bilateral cooperation, which is key to North American competitiveness. In New England and Eastern Canada, Manulife and John Hancock have thousands of employees, hundreds of thousands of customers, and billions of dollars well invested in these thriving jurisdictions. With the conference's focus on clean, ener clean energy, I'll note we have nearly $70 billion in green investments around the world covering renewable energy, energy efficient and net zero carbon real estate, and sustainable agriculture, uh, agriculture and forestry, including uh, Governor Mills, in an impact first forest investment of 89,800 acres in Maine, with the timberland being used primarily to store carbon. We're also one of the few companies that can say that they are net zero in their scope one and two emissions, and we have plans for even further reductions. It's one part of our broader commitment to our customers, investors, employees, the communities where we uh, have our employees, and other stakeholders who rely on us to be honest and fair and to care about our planet, the planet that we all share. We work hard to behave ethically in the communities where we operate to maintain the confidence of all of our stakeholders, and we recognize the importance of engaging with policymakers and our regulators to achieve our business ambitions. I can only imagine how difficult it is being an elected official these days in your jobs, and I want you to know that we value and appreciate your service in the public arena. I now have the pleasure of introducing my governor, and the first woman elected governor of Massachusetts and host to this year's conference. Governor Healy's leadership and commitment to meeting the climate crisis and investing in clean energy and climate innovation have been evident from day one, literally. On her first day in office, Governor Healy appointed the nation's first cabinet level climate chief and created the Office of Climate Innovation and Resilience. In her inaugural address, she said, where others may see hopelessness and resignation, I see unparalleled 
opportunity. We can protect our climate and create jobs. It's not too late to do either. It's urgent that we do both, and I believe Massachusetts can lead the world. John Hancock is proud to have its U.S. headquarters in Massachusetts, and it's my honor to introduce Governor Maura Healy. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Well, good morning, everyone, and great, uh, great to see you, Jim. Great to hear from you. And I had no idea about your Canadian connection. Amazing. So that's beautiful and, uh, and really appropriate for this, this convening. I want to thank you for uh, not just the generous introduction, but importantly for Manulife John Hancock's incredible investment and support of not just this conference, but of the work that we are trying to do here in the United States and in Canada. And we look forward to continued partnerships with you. I also want to thank President Gilliam, who is uh, about to, she's already started, of course, but she is um, Boston University's new president and doing a fantastic job. So we thank you with everything else you have going on that you took the time to be here and to welcome myself and Mayor Wu and our distinguished leaders uh, and guests to this really important convening. And we are particularly delighted to be in this building. Thank you for laying out for all of us what is exactly happening in this building and how it is being powered because it is a living, breathing example of what's possible. And the view isn't so bad, is it? Yeah. Except for those of you, Governor McKee should know better. You should have sat on this side because then you get to look out while everybody else is speaking and you don't have to, you know, but anyhow. Um, it's also incredibly special to have with us Mayor Wu, who is a fantastic mayor, uh, not just for the city of Boston, but a leader in this country. And I am grateful for her leadership on so many fronts, including on issues of climate. You are a true climate champion. You are constantly innovating and pushing and um, seizing the opportunity to do what is absolutely necessary and what is an opportunity alongside all of the work that this involves. So wonderful to be with you. Proud that Boston, Massachusetts, you know, we were just recently ranked the number one state for innovation, for education, best place to raise a family, best place to have a child, and uh, best place to live if you are a woman. So we're proud about that. Um, I'm thrilled to join my co-host, Premier Andrew Fury from the wonderful uh, province of Newfoundland and, and Labrador. We, we thank you for being here. We look forward to the opportunity to have this conference next year with you. Um, also, I give uh, the Premier great credit because even though we had a late night at the Sox, by the way, thank you for coming to the Sox. You all brought us good luck. We're chasing that wild card position, and, um, and we routed the Orioles last night, and I attribute that to all of you. Um, uh, Pre uh, Premier Fury got up this morning and ran along the Charles River, so he had an opportunity to, to take in what is a beautiful day uh, and weather that, that uh, Mayor Wu dialed up for all of us, so we thank you. Um, we are thrilled, on behalf of myself and the entire administration, we are thrilled to be hosting the 45th Annual New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers Conference. I want to thank all of our international guests, Premier Fury, as I mentioned, our co-host uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador, Premier Dennis King of Prince Edward Island, Minister Martin Biron from Quebec, Associate Deputy Minister Dave McGregor of Nova Scotia, and Executive Director Serge Bro of New Brunswick. I'm especially delighted to welcome our New England colleagues. Um, Governor Phil Scott from the great state of Vermont is with us, and uh, nobody uh, knows how to do groundswork at Fenway Park, it turns out, better than Phil Scott, who was <laughs> painting home plate in the pitcher's mound last night. They are ready to hire him. Um, we're also joined by Governor Janet Mills of, of Maine, special relationship, Massachusetts and Maine. At one time, we're one, we're, one, we're one sovereign. We should never have let you go. You have all those forests to play with that we don't have here. But it's always wonderful to have Governor Mills with us. Um, Governor Ned Lamont from Connecticut, 
I kid, basketball was invented in Massachusetts for the record. That said, the Yukon men and women's basketball teams dominate, and you have made Connecticut, the great nutmeg state, the basketball state. So wonderful to see you, Governor Lamont. And we won't talk about you being a Yankees fan. <laughs> and Governor Dan McKee from Rhode Island. We really love the work and the partnership with Rhode Island and um, look forward to all the work we're going to do together, especially on our new offshore wind uh, project, Governor McKee. So thank you. And thank you to all the teams, the staff, everybody who actually does the work, who is here um, and, and works day in and day out on these important, important issues. I want to thank members of our team, our great Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Rebecca Tepper, our Commissioner for the Department of Energy Resources, Elizabeth Mahoney, our Undersecretary for um, Energy and Environmental Affairs, Jason Marshall, along with other members of the team. I also want to thank Ellie Hitt and her team for helping to organize and put on all the logistics the last couple of days. Look, together we represent different places, different people, um, all unique and wonderful in, in their own ways, but we're here today not so much because of our differences, but because of what we have in common. We share a history and a culture that's intertwined. We share economic ties in very, very real ways that are continually reinforced through trade, through the movement of goods and people, um, and uh, electric power, which is something we're talking about. More fundamentally, we share geography, coastlines, rivers, forests, mountain ranges. We share a climate. And that climate is changing, as we all know. And as leaders, we've seen up close how this change harms and threatens our people's well-being in all kinds of ways, from extreme weather and flooding to the loss of biodiversity and resilience. So we are responding with a shared determination, not only to protect our homes, but to change this um, challenge into opportunity, opportunity that will benefit our residents, our economies, and our environment. This region, you know, New England and the Northeast, we've always led, um, and, uh, and we're excited to be here together with all of you. Yesterday, we, we started the day at Mass Maritime Academy in Buzzards Bay. We had an opportunity to see world-class training facilities for careers in offshore wind energy. We even tried out, some of us, the, the ship's bridge simulator, and thankfully, um, real vessels are going to be operated by trained mariners and not the likes of us. But it gave a great representation of what, uh, of what it's like as we were navigating our way through the wind fields offshore. Um, in climate technology, our academics, our startups, and growing companies are making world-changing breakthroughs. Mass Maritime represents for our entire region cutting-edge training, technology, and skills that our next-generation workforce will need to power our region forward. Um, we're going to be talking about our shared commitment to clean energy technology, technologies. We're going to focus on harnessing the power of one of our greatest sustainable shared resources, and that is offshore wind. We're also going to have an important conversation about how we decarbonize our economy as we grow. In Massachusetts, we're proud to be America's leader in offshore wind. We're even uh, more proud to be working closely with our New England neighbors. We're really in this together. We really, really are, us, us New England states and our eastern Atlantic provinces. We believe that. Uh, we've experienced that. And as we look ahead at what's in front of us, um, it's all the more important to, to call that out and to affirm that, and that's, that's why we're here today. Last week, as I mentioned, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, we went in big in selecting three new offshore wind projects from our historic joint solicitation. The result is adding 2,900 megawatts of new offshore wind power. That's enough to run 1.6 million homes or businesses, and it represents 20% of our current power needs here in Massachusetts. But we know that more clean power puts more pressure on our already strained electric grid. So we, like our other states and provinces, are focused on upgrades uh, to that grid. Last week, or no, a few weeks ago now, 
we got news from our federal partners that New England was selected to receive almost $400 million in funding for the Power Up project. So thank you to all the teams who worked hard on those applications. This is going to build new transmission equipment to deliver 4,800 megawatts of additional offshore wind at sites in Connecticut and right here in Massachusetts. The funding will also invest, importantly, in battery energy storage uh, systems in northern Maine, which will help dispatch carbon-free electricity over multiple days. So look, these projects are game changers, um, but we also know there's room. There's so much more room for the work ahead, and that's why we want to continue to work with our colleagues across the region and in uh, in Canada, because it's broad regional partnerships that are how we're going to get this done. Um, I'll just say that, you know, this is a, a sports town. Some of you were at the game last night. I am a true believer in teamwork. I believe that for the most intractable or seemingly intractable problems that we face today, we're only going to accomplish and find solutions through teamwork, through working together. Each of us has something to bring to the table. Um, each of us uh, has something to give here, and I think it's how we best maximize what we have for our own assets within our jurisdictions um, that we're going to make the most, and not just for our individual, not just for the region, but really too for our individual jurisdictions, which is something as leaders we all have to to look out for. But um, the time is now. Happy to be on the cutting edge of this with all of you, and I really, really appreciate. Um, your time here today, and it is my pleasure to bring to you our co-host for this conference um, and uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful leader. We've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time together talking about these issues, and I look forward to the continued work and, of course, returning to your wonderful home next year for the 46th conference. But let's welcome Premier Andrew Fury. Thanks so much, Governor. Uh, it is truly a, a pleasure to join you all here today. Uh, and a special thanks to the Governor and her whole team for hosting us in what is truly a spectacular backdrop. Um, we can't match the, the city sites, but we can certainly match it and perhaps outdo it with whales and icebergs and incredible <laughs> backdrops of beautiful vistas for next year. Um, I have to thank you again for hosting us last night at that uh, truly magical event in, in Fenway. My son, who's 13 now, uh, has shown very little interest in my career. Uh, but last night, my phone was lit up with, where are you now? What are you doing now? Are you at home plate now? Are you actually going to throw out a pitch now? So <laughs> thank you for creating some uh, interest in my life for my son. Uh, this is uh, truly a, an important conference. And I think uh, while the agenda is robust and important, and we'll tackle some challenging items. I think more importantly, it speaks to the most important and valued commodity in today's uncertain times, which is friendship. Um, our citizens, both local, in our own jurisdictions, across our countries, and indeed around the world are anxious right now as they look and see a time of anxiety, a time of uncertainty, and are indeed stressed. And they look to us, they look to us to navigate this important historical time. They look to us as Canada and the United States as a staple of certainty, an example of democracy, and a beacon of hope for them all to enjoy and to celebrate together around the world. So I'm so incredibly fortunate to be a part of what I know are true leaders who believe in the fundamental values which we all celebrate collectively despite the differences in our flags. I also have to tell you that my relationship, like Jim's, goes a bit further than uh, just this table. I had, uh, I also, I married an American, so it's, for me it's personal as well. Uh, different though, uh, when I first married, met my wife, I should say, I brought her home to my family in Newfoundland and Labrador, and I said, she's from Portland, and they said, oh, that's not too bad, she's from Maine. No, she's from Oregon. <laughs> so that, uh, that uh, created a bit of friction, but we spent some time in I trained in the United States, uh, did my some of my surgical training in Baltimore. My daughter from, was born in Baltimore, so we are truly committed, as you were, Jim, to being more than just a professional relationship. This is truly a personal relationship for me and one that I truly value. Whether for work or otherwise, though, like 
I'm sure Governor Healy will tell you, as she has a Newfoundland and Labrador connection herself, we like to take ownership of anyone who came from directly or indirectly Newfoundland and Labrador. We are the oldest part of the New World and the gateway to North America, and we like to take ownership, so we'll take ownership of you as well, Governor. But whether for work or otherwise, Newfoundlanders have been coming to and Boston. <laughs> no, we're not going to. No, you can have him. You can have him. You can have him. I'm, I apologize for even mentioning that to you last <laughs> Newfoundlanders have been coming to Boston and New England for ages. Uh, spend any time here, and it's not hard to see why. Maybe it's the Irish influence in how we share a common sense of humor and a work ethic that is only known to those from the Northeast. A never quit never back down this that comes from generations of surviving and thriving through every harsh element that this environment can sometimes dish up. You know yourselves with the ocean in our blood, there's nothing tougher than someone coming from the Northeast. It's just the type, a type of graduate you see coming from that legendary institution yesterday, and it was, I can tell you it was on full display at Mass Maritime Academy. Yesterday we were given a tour of this incredible facility. And since the late 1800s, this fabled institution has been producing stewards of our oceans. In Newfoundland and Labrador, we can certainly relate to that. In fact, we have close to five centuries of hard education on the sea. Our province was founded on abundant cod fishery. And through the years, many lessons were learned the hard way, but learned nonetheless. Over time, we've managed to improve, develop, protect, and diversify. We've also learned that harnessing our many, many natural resources is actually the courageous and bold step forward that our citizens need. This is evident in our new wind hydrogen energy industry. This game changing technology will come to define this time in our global transition, and we are playing an important part. It is inspiring to see how this esteemed institution, Maritime, Academy is shaping the ocean innovators and leaders of the future, and you're to be commended. As Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's a privilege to join such distinguished groups, groups here today, and I know we are all united as a region, as East Coasters. And our gathering represents not just two nations, but an integrated region, a collective that shares common goals, challenges, but most importantly, opportunities. Together, we are more than a band of states and provinces. We are connected, thriving corridor of innovation, commerce, and shared natural resources. As maritime folk, we fully understand how our economies, our people, and our environment are intertwined. What happens in one jurisdiction will resonate and ripple across all others. And in the spirit of this collaboration, this shared experience, today's discussions are essential and crucial. Because right now, we stand at a pivotal moment in human history. The demand for bold action on renewable energy, climate resilience, and cross-border participation and partnerships is more urgent than ever before. The choices made at these tables and the actions we take individually and collectively will most certainly shape the future of our region for generations to come. This is a significant weight for everybody at this table but one I know everybody owns and takes full responsibility of. It's a crossroads of our shared history, but equally an unbelievable opportunity that we must explore. Renewable energy, as the governor said, is an economic driver, a job creator, and a critical component of each of our climate strategies. Our ability to work together to leverage our collective strengths and to remove barriers across borders and boundaries will determine how effectively we can transition to a clean, green future. That could mean shared infrastructure planning or policy and regulatory alignment to diversify our energy supply and partnering to invest in new clean technologies. If we collaborate, we will succeed and chart a course for other regions and countries to follow. So there's a lot at stake here. Our meeting is more than just about energy or trade. It's about the well-being and future of our citizens and the sustainability of our economies and the protection of our treasured environment. Today's North America has its roots in our shared maritime legacy of this proud Northeast. We built the ships and we fished the waters 
that fed our people, developed our economies, and helped define who we are today. They are the workers, the doers, the achievers. They are ours. Together, we have always been a powerhouse for innovation and progress, and leaders in environmental sports, for who are those who understand that truly the balance is between where and how you work. We have the responsibility to lead others by our example. I look forward to our discussions today and Massachusetts continued leadership, which is on full display by multiple speakers here today, and particularly in Governor Healy's leadership, in driving us towards sustainable, achievable, real solutions for our citizens. Outcomes that will not only benefit our region, but will help strengthen the resilience and prosperity of our entire quarter as an example for the rest of the world. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu is a daughter of immigrants who in November of 2021 became the first woman, first mom, and first person of color to be elected mayor in Boston, championing a vision of this city as a home for everyone. And as we just heard, the results seem to speak for themselves. Please welcome Mayor Wu. Good morning, all. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thank you so much, Premier, for your kind introduction and also for your leadership. We are thrilled to welcome you here in Boston and um, to be benefiting from the fruits of your leadership as well. Um, thank you, of course, to my governor, uh, an incredible partner and someone that I'm blessed every single day to be able to work alongside, to troubleshoot with, and to see the scale of what she is accomplishing through her administration, setting the tone nationally and creating not only the uh, infrastructure for Massachusetts residents to thrive, but the template for collaboration and coordination around the world uh, to really drive us forward. So thank you to everyone on your team as well. I see Secretary Tepper here and, and to everyone who has had a hand in making today's convening possible. Uh, I'm grateful to our hosts at this site, uh, Madam President, whose uh, leadership we are all so thrilled and excited for and has already hit the ground running. I will say um, Boston University is not only an example of walking the walk with the incredible academic research and innovation that's happening with the facilities and really living the, being the proof of what's possible through applying the, the theory to, to reality, um, but also your deep involvement in the community and really setting the tone for what it means to be embedded within the city. Thank you so much. Same goes for Jim and Manulife, uh, John Hancock. You all have truly been a partner as our, one of our proud anchor businesses here in Boston through many, many generations and, and eras of showing how your involvement with our young people, with health and well-being, and um, the, the future of this city has made a difference. So thank you for your involvement here today. I will share a little, I share a little bit of um, the Premier's sort of um, understanding that at home, you're not as impressive in some ways, right? My kids, my kids are a little bit younger. They're seven and nine, but not too much about my job uh, ever sparks that, that sense of, of wonder and, and uh, true, uh, truly being impressed. But this building, I will say, is one that they always recognize. And every time we get to pass by it or see it, it sparks an entree for me to be able to talk about geothermal and <laughs> try to stuff all of the policy in because it is also such a striking example of architecture. Um, I also want to thank Deputy Chief of Staff for en Energy and Environmental Affairs, Paolo Di Fabio, who I know has been instrumental in organizing this as well. And I'm joined here today by our City of Boston Chief of Climate, or Chief Climate Officer, Brian Sweat. Um, thank you, thank you for all that you do every single day. Welcome to all of our distinguished guests. We are so honored to be here with you today. I come just to say welcome to Boston. Thank you for your spark for the Red Sox. And um, thank you as a local municipal official. You all live every single day the urgency, the pressures that our community members face. And it is truly the governors and premiers working alongside your local municipal officials who have to get things done, who have no choice but to move forward and find a pathway to execute. And in this moment, when it feels there's so much coming at all of our community members from all sides, we know that finding the anchors for coordination, for progress, 
um, are, are places we truly have to double down on right now. I'm very grateful that you've chosen clean energy as the anchor for this convening as well. This room doesn't have to uh, be reminded that clean energy is good policy, it's good economics, and it's necessary infrastructure for the safety and health and well-being and prosperity of our communities. We're trying to live that every single day in Boston in partnership with Governor Healy's administration. From opting into the state's specialized energy stretch code, which we're thrilled is uh, making sure that we are moving as quickly as possible and accelerating fossil fuel free construction, to our own executive order at the local level requiring all new municipal construction and major renovations to be fossil fuel free. We're also working on green energy retrofit pilot programs for those older uh, residential housing stock property owners of small multifamily multi homes, affordable housing units, and ensuring that there are funds for electrification. So far, the estimated energy cost savings for those projects range from 43% to 72%, all dollars back into our residents' pockets with similar reductions in operational emissions, and not to mention the health benefits of breathing cleaner air in your own home. I also want to lift up the uh, recent wind procurement. So of all of those uh, thousands of megawatts that will now be serving, or soon in a few years, be serving the New England area, Boston is especially excited because we were actually part of one of those bids. And so about 15 of those megawatts will be directly for the city of Boston. We believe we're the first major city to directly contract as part of an offshore wind procurement. And that equivalent will be one, it's the equivalent of one wind turbine which will go to serve 5,000 residents in the city of Boston, along with about a third of the energy for the Boston public school system. So we're eager to uh, see that, that move forward as well. So as you discuss the strategies for hard to decarbonize sectors, I am just emphasizing our gratitude in that this work is, is not easy. Climate challenges, decarbonization, is as much about creating opportunities for our communities as it is about protecting them from risks and so thank you for digging in. Thank you for setting the tone for generations to come. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass it on to Paolo. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Wu. Uh, I am Deputy, uh, Secretary Tepper's Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say, as uh, Mayor mentioned, I've been part of the team, that the governor tasked with planning and leading the execution of this conference. Uh, she already mentioned the incomparable my fellow Terrier, fellow diehard Celtics fan, we should give the defending champs some love today too, uh, Ellie Hitt, uh, and also uh, Susanna Hatch, the DOER Chief of Staff. Uh, we've spent the past nine plus months planning this. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed the experience as much as we enjoyed making all of this happen. Uh, and so thank you to all of our welcome speakers. And with that, I now have the dubious distinction of trying to keep us on time for the rest of the day. Uh, so at this point, I would ask that if uh, the members of the press and those guests here who are not participating in our first closed roundtable, if you would please uh, clear the room so that we can begin all this 